My first car was a 1966 Mustang. Candy apple red, white little racing stripes, I guess they're racing stripes, white stripes down the door. Nice big engine, Alpine stereo system, which was the priority back then. Uh, that thing would rock out. That was nice. You could hear me coming down the street. It was awesome. And in those good old days, you got your full driver's license on your 15th birthday. That's partly how old I am. But you took your, you took your test, and on your 15th birthday, you took your driving test, and they gave you a full license. There was none of this, like, I need somebody driving me for a while, whatever that's called. Nothing. Day 14 years old, 364 days, you can't touch a car. 15th birthday, you can go anywhere you want. That's always not necessarily wise. But anyway, a month later, I was gifted this 19... 66 Mustang, did pretty good for a year, driving it with no problems, no wrecks, no incidents. By the time I got 16 though, I, was, I grew up in Jackson, so I was dating this girl in Jackson. I lived in Jackson, but she lived in Brandon. And so if you know anything about the geography, that's a good 25, 30 minute drive. Um, and I went round and round with very strict parents about curfew. As in 11 p.m. my senior year, I had to be back in the house. And so my dad and I never saw eye to eye on curfew. Just never did. So I got really pretty good at figuring out, here's dad's rules. Here's how I circumvent those rules and still stay in compliance. I became an expert because my dad was strict. So if I, did, if I just did everything he wanted, I'd never do anything. So I had to do stuff and figure out how to make it look like I was still doing what he wanted me to do. And when we went around around the curfew, what that meant was home at 11. And what I could never help him understand is, but dad, I'm dating a girl in Brandon, which means the date's over at 10. Because I gotta take her back to Brandon and then come home. And that, the whole point was, he wanted me off the road at 11, but we never saw, we never got in, I mean, like, the date's over at 10, this is ridiculous, right? So this one particular night, we pushed the boundaries of the 11 o'clock curfew pretty hard. And so when I dropped her off, I had roughly 15 to 20 minutes to beat curfew. And so I took full advantage of a 1966 Mustang to try to beat curfew. This was my workaround plan for the evening. I'm like, okay, I spent lots of time. Now I've got to make some of that time up. <laughs> so coming back from Brandon down Airport Road in Jackson. Now, if anybody knows anything about Jackson and about Airport Road, that is watched, or at least back in my day, was watched by the police officers like a hawk kind of like trying to go through Louisville coming to Starkville. Like, that was the speed trap. And so I'm 95, 98, 96 miles an hour going down Airport Road trying to beat this curfew, and I went, it occurred to me, they watched this road. So I backpedaled a little bit, slowed down to about, you know, 75 <laughs> in a 55 speed limit. And this is a four-lane wide-open highway, and I'm 55. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness I wasn't doing the 95 when I got pulled over, but I did get pulled over for the 75. First ticket, 16 years old. My dad in his infinite wisdom, well, it looked like this. Of course, I was late for curfew, right? Because <laughs> I had 20 minutes, and I had 15 with the cop. So, you know, curfew failed in my mission. Didn't matter how fast I was going, I failed. So I'm going home, not just late for curfew. Now I have a brand shiny new ticket to show my dad my strict, loving, wonderful dad. Look, and the cop did the strangest thing. He took my license and gave me the ticket and said, this is your license until you appear in court or settle the ticket. Do they still, do they do that? Like, he took my license and kept it and gave me a yellow slip of paper. And I'm trying to figure out all the way home, like, how am I going to tell dad, A, why I'm late, and B, why I'm really late. And so I just walked in the door, and of course, he's sitting in the living room wondering where I've been. I handed him the ticket, and I just kept right on moving. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have the strength or the heart to go, mm, I got a speed ticket, here's my license. I think that's what I said to him. I was like, this is my driver's license for now, and I just went to my room. Well, my dad, in his infinite wisdom, said, you're going to go up here in front of the judge. I'm 16. I've never been to court in my life. I've never been in trouble with the law in my entire life. I'm like, okay. A little intimidating. It's the traffic court. It's not that big a deal. It's like gavel and move on, right? So I go in there, and I'm standing in front of the judge. And really, I think my dad wanted me in front of the judge just to drive home the circumstances, if you will. But the judge asks me a question. He says, I can't remember the exact language, but he goes, basically, do you want 
a trial was the way he asked. Well, I thought that's why I was there. I'm in front of a judge. I'm in a courtroom. So I said, yes. Which means I'm challenging the ticket. <laughs> I didn't know that. I answered the question. I'm going, yeah, we're in a court. Yeah, I want a trial. I thought that's what I thought we were there for. The gracious judge pulls the, the public defender and says, will you go talk to this young man in this side before, and we'll reconvene in a minute. I'm like, speeding ticket, grounded. Now the judge is like, will you go talk some sense into this dude? I mean, that's basically what's happening. So he pulls me into the side chamber and he goes, you're just supposed to say no, you don't contest this. The judge does this, here's the fine. Go, oh, I thought I was supposed to say yes. I didn't know. So I have to go back in front of this judge and I just went, yes. And he, goes, and he, asked, and he asked again, do you want a trial? No, sir. <laughs> what's the correct answer? The sense of relief when he goes, all right, the fine is, it was like, $5 per every hour over, yeah, $100? Because I was 75 and a 55 on my first ticket. $100 fine. By the way, this is like 1987, so $100 is more probably like 300 now, I don't know. The deal was I had to pay for it. So my 16-year-old working self now had to cough up 100 bucks trying to, for trying to beat curfew. But I had an immense sound, sense of relief that it wasn't worse than that. I mean, the judge like, boop, you're guilty, $100 fine. You can restore your license, pay the clerk on the way out. I'm like, that's it? Cool. My dad wasn't cool with it, but cool, you know, like, okay, that's not so bad. The consequences were way worse at home. But in front, as far as the judge is concerned, I felt an immense sense of relief. And I didn't get, like, forgiveness. That would have been bonus, right? Except the ticket, apparently, since I went before the judge, did not appear on my record. So in a sense, I did get a pass, a financial expense, but not a like, oh, it's in your driving record now, it's a consequence. No, the consequences were much greater at home. I did not drive the beautiful Mustang for a while. Well, at least until they need me to go to the grocery store like four days later. <laughs> I love my parents. You're grounded from your car for a week. Okay, two days later. No, we're really dependent on you driving places now, so here, go get stuff for us. Okay. <laughs> consequence didn't really work. So in a sense, I'm like, I'm not even grounded from the car. I'm already driving to the grocery store two days later. I got a pass. Minus the $100 fine, if you will. Well, we are going to talk about what it means to stand in front of a judge a little bit today and what it means to feel really forgiven and really at peace or not. So turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We're going to read a story of a woman who encounter, has an encounter with Jesus and a Pharisee. This is Luke 7, starting in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that she, he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him and that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then, turning toward the woman, he said, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love, but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives Sins, and he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. 
So Jesus goes to a party and a dinner invite by a Pharisee. And they're lounging at the table. That's the way it's described. You get this picture. In those days, you laid down for the meal with your feet to the outside, and it's in a circle. And so Jesus' head would have been closer to the Pharisee and feet toward the wall, and so would all the other guests that way. So they're having a conversation over dinner as they incline. But there was a custom, a social custom, when they threw this kind of party, that the poor could come and wait around the outside and eat from the leftovers, from the scraps. They could glean from the meal. And so this woman, when it tells us the woman took advantage of knowing this, knowing what kind of party it was, knowing she could go in and be a part of it and be near Jesus, took advantage of the situation. And so that's why it says she is standing at the feet of Jesus. She is standing with everybody else who has not, doesn't have enough food to eat, waiting for the party to be over to interact with Jesus. Well, she doesn't really wait, does she? She knew she wanted to be near Jesus. She wanted to talk to him, so she takes advantage of it. And she's already crying when the story starts. Did you notice that? Look at verses 36 to 38 again. As soon as I find them. Here we go. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. A, and a woman in the city who was a sinner having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. She continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Okay, I love the the writer, Luke, says, this woman, a sinner. So we know that to mean there has to be more to it than, oh, she's just not a good person. She's got some label on her that brands her as a publicly known sinner. Holy, she's that kind of person. We think maybe prostitution was the case. We don't know. But she has some level of like scarlet letter brand on her that she is guilty. She's a sinner. She's not who she's supposed to be. You're not supposed to hang around them, right? You're not supposed to be around, especially if you're a Pharisee or if you're a prophet then you shouldn't be contaminated that kind of, by that kind of person. At least that's the attitude of the Pharisee who's allowing poor people to eat, or eat the scraps from his table. The Pharisee, the religious leader and Bible scholar, is throwing a party and letting people that are poor eat leftovers. That's an interesting picture right there, isn't it? We're cool. We're laying on the couch talking about spiritual things and hanging out with Jesus, and they're standing over there starving, and they got to wait till we finish. This is already set up as a little bit of a weird thing. But this woman takes advantage of the fact that anybody can come to this party and hang out. And she's weeping when the story starts. She wants, she's already upset about something. She's already either feeling very, maybe she's already had an encounter with Jesus. Or maybe she recognizes who Jesus is and feels the immensity of that brand. She's a sinner. Either way, she's already crying when the story unfolds. And she proceeds to cry on his feet and kiss his feet and wipe them with her hair. Back in those days, not everybody had cool Nikes. You walked around in dirt, barefoot. You walked around in sandals, maybe. And you walked everywhere you went. You didn't hop on Uber. So everywhere you went, you traveled through dirt, or stuff, whatever. And you go into somebody's house, the custom would be automatically to be what? <laughs> I hope it's to wash your feet. We take off, sometimes we take our shoes off and go to somebody's house. We don't want our shoes to get our friend's floor dirty or whatever. Yeah. You walk everywhere barefoot and starkle for two weeks and look at your feet. Right? This is the kind of thing that's going on. And so she's, that's what she is lowering herself to clean. And we know the Pharisee didn't offer him anything because later in the story. So this is not a case where he got him washed and then she did this. She is cleaning his feet. She's weeping over her sin and guilt and over her life and who she is and who Jesus is. Imagine the wide open humility of doing this in front of everybody. Everybody knows you're a sinner for whatever the sinning thing was. And you are doing this for Jesus in front of the room, in front of religious leaders, in front of wealthy people, in front of good people, in front of the rest of the poor in town, in public, in front of everybody. 
Imagine what they might have said. The Pharisees' response to the circumstances is to judge, not the woman. He's already judged her. Remember, she's the sinner. How does he respond? He judges Jesus. That's a brave strategy. He judges Jesus. He says, if Jesus was a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman's touching him. And he wouldn't let it happen. If he really could read minds and be prophetic, and be, if he really is who he says he is, he'd know, and he'd never let somebody who's unclean clean his feet. So he must not be a prophet. By the way, the passage tells us that he tells himself this. In other words, the writer has given us inside baseball of what's going on in his mind. He didn't go, hey, that Jesus over there is letting hurt. He says to himself, what does Jesus do? Being the prophet that he is knows exactly what Simon is thinking. He says, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. Notice he doesn't call him prophet. He says, go ahead, teacher. What do you have to say? He can tell what Jesus is thinking, or Jesus can tell what Simon is thinking. Uh, verse 41. I think this is where we are. Jesus spoke up and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he said, speak. And he tells a story. A certain creditor had two, had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, one owed 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them would love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who canceled the great, he, whom, for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. So he knows, what the, he knows what the prophet is thinking. And he tells a story. He says, I got something to share with you. These two people have debt. One owes 50 bucks, one owes 500 bucks, and he cancels the debt. Which one's more grateful? And what's interesting is Simon says, it's almost, there's almost some hesitation in their response. He didn't go, oh, the one, I, well, I suppose the one who had a greater debt. Simon's a smart guy. You think he knows where Jesus is going already? It's almost as he goes, he has to begrudgingly admit that the one who had the greater debt is the one who has the greater forgiveness or has the greater love for the one who forgave. If you're Simon, who just judged the woman for who she is and judged Jesus for not being the one he thought he was, and you think you are without sin because you're a Pharisee and you keep all the Ten Commandments and you're too good and don't need forgiveness, how do you think that story registers with you? <laughs> you're the 50-buck one, Simon. She's the 500. And so he has to begrudgingly admit, well, I guess the one who owes a greater debt loves God more. He just had to admit to the room that the woman at the, at the foot of Jesus who was cleaning dirt with her tears, loves God more than he does. The religious leader, the Pharisee, the one who keeps all ten of the commandments. Jesus has got him to admit that. Well, I suppose the one with the greater debt. <laughs> I guess I have to admit something's going on here. He connects the Pharisee to the one who has been forgiven little. Look at verse 44. I suppose you have judged correctly. The one who's greater debt is the one who would, who would love more. Then turning toward the woman, he says to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. See, I told you he didn't wash his, have his feet washed. But she bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which were many, <laughs> by the way, she is the higher debt, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one who little is forgiven loves little. Then he says to her, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus is basically, in case you didn't connect the dots, Simon, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you showed me no appreciation whatsoever. He calls Simon out. Apparently Simon 
because he wasn't sure about who Jesus was or he was skeptical and Jesus is not, Jesus isn't even good enough for me. Didn't show him the, current, the, the socially accepted hospitality. Didn't wash his feet. Didn't greet him with a kiss. Didn't provide anything for him. Just said, there's your spot. The woman who was not a religious leader, who was not wealthy, who was not upstanding, in fact is considered scum of the earth, essentially, showed Jesus greater love and he calls him on it. Her actions came out of love. Her tears came out of love. Therefore, her sins, which, by the way, are many, she does have great debt, are forgiven. But for you, my buddy, <laughs> maybe you haven't been forgiven a lot yet, if at all, right? Interesting story, interesting dialogue, interesting set of scenarios, right? That Jesus is in the midst of, by the way. Jesus is at the Pharisee's house. You know the Pharisee has him there to try to figure out if Jesus is the real deal. This whole thing is a test. And so when he doesn't really understand who the woman is, the Pharisee's mind, he's failed the test. It's a trap. I'm going to bring him over and see what he does about it. So what are these implications of this story for us then? Like what does this story back then have to do with us now? Well, the story compares the Pharisee and the woman, right? The Pharisee is indifferent, didn't give Jesus anything. He's judgmental, no prophet, sinner, right? No prophet, she's awful. He's extremely compliant and religious, does the party he's supposed to do, you know, to feed the poor who eat the scraps. Does his duty. Is he forgiven? If he is, it's not much, right? But then you have the woman. She's broken and humble. She's going where the poor people are. She's cleaning Jesus' feet with her own tears, with her own hair, in front of everybody. She's transparent. She does not hold back for the fact that she's guilty of all this stuff, does she? She's weeping over her sin and over her life and over her choices. She's filled with love and faith and demonstrates it by the attention she pays to Jesus. At least I can do this for him. And Jesus says to her, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. So you have the religious leader who's supposed to have it all together and the woman who clearly does not. And it is her that Jesus holds up as demonstrating great love. It says her sins are forgiven, but he also says her actions have shown her love. And if you're a rule keeper and you obey the speed limit, and you obey your dad's rules, and you don't rebel, and you don't do those things. You can do all those things and be a good person. But you can also comply with that entire checklist and have no love in your heart. Now, I love my dad. Let's just be clear. <laughs> but you can try to artificially comply with everything God expects you to do. Go to church. Tithe. Go to small group. Read your Bible. If the religion of, if your faith is a checklist of things, you can comply with that all you want and have no love inside of your heart. Or, which is what the Pharisees did, we keep all the commandments. Really? Then why did Jesus call you a whitewashed tomb that's dead on the inside? There was nothing going on in here. It was not driven out of who they truly are. But if you're a follower of Jesus then your heart is filled with God's Spirit. Your heart is filled with God's love, and that is what drives the actions. That is why you do the list. Not because you're trying to keep a checklist, but because you want, you'll go to the most extreme place that you have to go just to be at Jesus' feet because you want to be there. You're willing to sacrifice. You're willing to humble yourself. You realize that you have a great debt, and when you realize that He has given you a pass, you have a great debt. Response. Love for God is not an achievement or a checklist. It is a state of heart that wants to honor and worship God. The woman demonstrated it. That is the vocation of our true self, love and compassion. Our calling on our life as Christ followers is to demonstrate love and compassion. You know, it's funny. In church circles and in church culture and all this kind of thing, you hear conversion stories, right? You hear testimonies, powerful testimonies, amazing works of God. This person was this, and now he's this. 
And that's true, and the Holy Spirit works in radical ways in our lives. And people have been, you know, in complete rebellion with God for 45 years, and suddenly the light turns on and they come to Jesus, and they, and they light up with God. You know those people? Like, after 30 years of being not in church at all, they're the most devout Christians you know. You ever experienced that person? And then you have those of us who grew up in church, who have been praying the Lord's Prayer since we were two, went to a Christian school maybe, maybe went to a Christian college, never really went that far off the deep end. Maybe a speeding ticket was as bad as you ever got, <laughs> right? I mean, you don't know. And then you become a Christian and you go, this is really cool. I like loving Jesus. But I've been a pretty good person so far. In fact, if you're that person, then usually you, sometimes you even feel jealous of the story that we glorify, which is this radical change story, Right? But have you ever wondered why they're so radically on fire compared to the person who was raised in church their whole life? They're the woman. Those who have been forgiven a great debt love God more than those forgiven little. Now, does that mean your, if your story is relatively peaceful and a speeding ticket's about as far off the beaten path as you got? that you're not a good Christian or you're not a good person? Of course that's not what I'm saying. Or that God doesn't love you or that you don't love God a lot. That's not what I'm saying. But when that person who's had the history of not knowing Jesus realizes, becomes a Christian, and the Holy Spirit goes, look at all this stuff that was not, you realize what your debt is, then of course you're going to weep. Of course you're going to find yourself at Jesus' feet with great love and devotion because your credit card balance was huge. <laughs> By the way, both balances are big because there is no, I can get, I got a small balance, I get into heaven. That's not how it works either. By the way, whether you're the, whether you're the Pharisee or you're the woman, both need the love and forgiveness of God. The reality is those with great debt experience it differently and live out of it differently, but not better, just different. We tend to hold up these stories like, this is how it is to become a Christian. And sometimes if we're like, not that person, we're like, I don't know, that's not be a very good Christian. No, if you love God, you love God. If you're a child of God, then your heart is love and compassion. And what Jesus tells us in this story is that it is, that's the part we're supposed to live from. I said this last week. If you're living out of love, then you keep the rules. If you, live out, if you live to keep the rules, you'll burn out and fail. If you're focused on avoiding whatever it is you gave up for Lent, you'll fail. If you're focused on worshiping God while you're not doing whatever you gave up for Lent, you will succeed. It's a change in focus. It's a why issue. It's a why we're doing it. Lent is not a season where we tidy up our spiritual appearance and work on our checklist. Well, this, for 40 days, my checklist is a little more complete. <laughs> or not, depending on how good at this we are. It is a season where we are called to evaluate who and what we really love. Do I love Jesus enough to be at his feet in tears? Regardless of your spiritual background. Does it come naturally from who much? If I'm a child of God, then love and the fruit of the Spirit ought to come out of that heart. It's fruit. It shouldn't be work or a checklist. It should be out of our true self. If we're living in our true self, if you're reading the devotion with us, there was a, we had this conversation in here a little while ago, but one of the, one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. That sounds like fun, Right? Self-control is a compliance fruit. Let me get some more of that fruit of my spirit. You know, I mean, and the, the journal was talking about the fact that self-control really isn't about den self-denial. It's about living into your true self and allowing Christ to have control of yourself. To allow the Holy Spirit to control yourself is the ultimate fruit of self-control. If you're trying to keep a list, you're going to fail. If you're allowing the Holy Spirit to guide your steps and your path, then you're living from your true self. You're not just a broken sinner. You're a child of God who has been forgiven much 
probably more than you realize. I mean, I held up these two different people, right? Just because you grew up in church doesn't mean you don't need a lot of forgiveness. <laughs> sorry, sorry to break the news to you. You may not feel it. You may not experience the contrast, but the debt is the same. What God wants is for you to come to Him with the same reckless abandon as the woman. He just wants your heart. He just wants you to live from the heart that He's given you and not try to be the Mr. Perfect Pharisee because you're not. He just wants you to have the same reckless, fruitful, incredibly loving, abundant fruit, whatever that's for. I lost my track of my thought. You get the idea, right? I can't even articulate what I'm talking about. But you know it when you feel it. When you live from who God is making you to be, Compliance isn't an issue. If I'd approached speeding and driving and my dad's rules as I love my dad, he must have set those for me for a reason, I wouldn't have had the speeding ticket. But when he says, you must be home by 11, and my brain goes, how can I get as close to 11 as possible? <laughs> I'm trying to comply. I'm not living in... You know why he wants me off the road at 11? It had nothing to do with curfew and freedom. It had everything to do with safety because what happens after 11 on the road? The heart of the rule was protection of me. I just heard it as a social prison. <laughs> right? The date's over at 10 is what I heard. He's like, yeah, but you'll be safer at home after 11. And so when God puts something in our life, we go, That's, uh, uh, I don't want to comply with that. Maybe it's the heart of the Father we need that makes us want to do that for whatever, because we love Him, not because we have to do what He tells us to do. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time. Give us hearts of reckless abandonment for you. Help us to remember that love is not a to-do list or an obligation, but a way to live into who you've made us to be. A way of orienting our life to where compliance is not an issue, but a life of worship is what comes from it. God, remind us of just how great your love is and how great your grace is so that our hearts will be filled with that reckless abandon for you. In Christ's name, amen.